Hello, everybody. I'm Toby Mueller, the moderator of uh, this conference on violence. And uh, thanks again for having me. You'll have to be seeing quite a bit of me until tomorrow night, I'm afraid. So uh, this morning, I said that the format will be pretty much the same all through the conference, except for the closing discussion tomorrow night. That was uh, the first mistake I think I made, because uh, the next performance, lecture, talk will be quite different in that respect, as you will see in quite a moment. I'll tell you more about that after I will have introduced our next guest, our next speaker. I hope you had a good lunch, and I hope your stomach is stable, because our subject now is going to get gory, so to speak, and I do not mean that all that metaphorically. Our next speaker actually coined the term gore capitalism with a book of the same title, conjuring up images of horror and splatter. And who could say this were far-fetched in the new landscapes of war, how she calls it? Our speaker is an activist intellectual in the transfeminist from Tijuana, Mexico, a famous border town. And this will play a role in her talk. We will hear the beginning of this essay that I'm quoting MIT Press now, quote, that posits a decolonial feminist philosophical approach to the outbreak of violence in Mexico and more broadly across the global regions in the third world. She uses that term on purpose. Maybe we can explore on why in our conversation afterwards. She argues that violence itself has become a product within hyper-consumerist neoliberal capitalism and that tortured and mutilated bodies have become commodities to be traded and utilized for profit in an age of impunity and governmental austerity, quote end. So our guest is not going to read her talk herself, but has brought a recording read by the translator uh, of her book, Core Capitalism, called John Plucker. For the conversation afterwards, we will have a whispering uh, translation by Kai Kempe. And after uh, the recording of the talk, she will be present here on stage. She will show you some pictures um, you know, uh, that will clarify more of her concept of core capitalism. Then we'll have the conversation, the three of us with the translator here on stage, and then it's your turn. So this is going to be same as this morning, I guess. Now I'm very pleased to introduce her, that she has made the long journey from uh, Tijuana here to us in Frankfurt. Please welcome Sayak Valencia. Capitalism. We propose the term gore capitalism to refer to the reinterpretation of the hegemonic global economy in geographic border spaces. As an example of this phenomenon, we propose the city of Tijuana, located at the border between Mexico and the United States, and known as the far corner of Latin America. We take the term gore from a genre of films characterized by extreme, brutal violence. Thus, gore capitalism refers to the undisguised and unjustified bloodshed that is the price the third world pays for adhering to the increasingly demanding logic of capitalism. It also refers to the many instances of dismembering and disbowelment, often tied up with organized crime, gender, and the predatory uses of bodies. In general, this term posits these incredibly brutal kinds of violence as tools of necro-empowerment. Bodies are here conceived of as products of exchange that alter and break capital's logics of production, subverting the terms of capital by substituting commodity production with a commodity made flesh in the body and human life through predatory techniques of extreme violence like kidnapping and contract murder. Thus, when we say gore capitalism, we refer to the disruption of values and practices taking place most visibly in border territories where one must ask, quote, what converging types of strategies are being developed by subalterns, the marginalized, under the transnationalizing forces of the first world, end quote. Unfortunately, many of the strategies for confronting the first world are ultra-violent forms of capital accumulation, practices that we characterize as gore. To further clarify this term, whereas in the first volume of Capital, Marx writes that, 
quote, the wealth of societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails appears as an immense accumulation of commodities, end quote. In Gore capitalism, this process is redirected, and the destruction of the body becomes in itself the product or commodity. The only kind of accumulation possible now is through a body count, as death has become the most profitable business in existence. We do not seek purity, correctness, or incorrectness in the application of the logic of capitalism and its intended and unintended consequences. We do not seek to make value judgments, but rather to provide evidence of the failure of neoliberal discourse to explain said phenomena. Contemporary approaches are insufficient to theorize the Gore practices that are now found around the world. This fact shows the need for such theorization in a world in which there is no space outside capitalism's reach. Not conceptualizing Gore practices does not do away with them, but merely renders them invisible or discusses them using language that creates a double standard inside of a theory, where terms like black market refer to economic practices specific to the third world, since they are already considered illegal. We're interested in developing a discourse with the explanatory power to help us interpret the reality produced by Gorp capitalism, found in violence, drug trafficking, and necropower, while at the same time presenting the dystopias of globalization and its imposition. We are also interested in following the multiple threads that give rise to the capitalist practices underpinned by extreme and ultra-specialized forms of violence, practices that in certain geopolitical locales have become established as everyday forms of violence used to obtain recognition and economic legitimacy. The raw nature of this violence obeys a logic born out of structures and processes planned in the very heart of neoliberalism, globalization, and politics. We are talking about practices that are transgressive solely because their forcefulness makes the vulnerability of the human body clear and how it is mutilated and desecrated. These practices constitute a scathing critique of the society of hyperconsumption, at the same time as they participate in it and in capitalism's inner workings, since, quote, in many nations, organized crime has become a key political actor and an interest group, a player that must be taken into consideration by the legitimate political system. This criminal element frequently provides necessary foreign currency, jobs, and the economic well-being essential for national stability, as well as the enrichment of those who hold political power, through at times corrupt means, especially in poor countries." End quote. These practices have reached ever more shocking extremes with the advent of globalization, as it is founded on predatory logics that, along with spectralization and speculation in financial markets, foment and implement radically violent practices. In the words of Thomas Friedman, former special advisor to Secretary of State Madeleine Albright during the Clinton administration, quote, for globalization to work, America can't be afraid to act like the almighty superpower that it is. The hidden hand of the market will never work without a hidden fist. McDonald's cannot flourish without McDonnell Douglas, the designer of the F-15, and the hidden fist that keeps the world safe for Silicon Valley's technology is called the United States Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps." End quote. Mary Louise Pratt further discusses globalization as a false protagonist. Quote, the term globalization eliminates understanding, even the desire for understanding. In this sense, globalization functions at times as a kind of false protagonist, which impedes a sharper interrogation of the processes that have been reorganizing practices and meanings during the last 25 years." End quote. If we draw on this analysis, we could say that what we are designating here as Gore capitalism is one of the processes of globalization, its B-side, unmasking the extent of its consequences. For this reason, we do not deny the complexity of the phenomenon, and will inquire into the array of consequences that exceed the interpretive regime that undergirds capitalist monopoly. In the same sense, given the existence of movements, discourses, and resistance activities that seek to confront the reach of capitalist discourse, we think it is vital to clarify that our reflections on Gore capitalism do not share the assumptions of, nor are they limited to, capitalist discursive practices. We propose Gore capitalism then as a heteroclite space that has not been sufficiently theorized within these alternatives to capitalism, which understand Gore capitalism as strongly rooted in capitalist logic and so relegated to the realm of the irrational, 
labeling it undesirable and dystopian. In a similar way, the process of Gore capitalism is rendered invisible by the discourse of the official capitalist economy and neglected within its system of thought. It is not considered especially significant or complex, despite its noteworthy explicatory functions, but rather it is delegated to consideration only as part of the black market and its effects on capital. However, now that the criminal economy is estimated to make up no less than 15% of global commerce, the effects of core capitalism on the world economy is evident. These numbers bestow it with real power in terms of planetary economic decisions. The urgency of devising a critical discourse that describes core capitalism derives in part from the need to have a common language with which to discuss the phenomenon, for it is well known that, quote, the world reveals itself in language and social relations are elaborated within language, end quote. As language is a core element in the epistemological organization of the world, we think it is vital to investigate, review, reason through, and attempt to propose an explanatory discourse that might provide us with a conceptual frame to think through, analyze, and approach these spaces, fields, and their practices. We also think it is essential to name these spaces, fields, and their practices from a trans-feminist perspective, by which we mean a network that opens discursive spaces and fields to all those contemporary practices and subjects that have not been directly analyzed. We are especially concerned with the lack of explanatory language for the phenomena we identify here with the term corp capitalism. We cannot ignore the relationships between legal and illegal economies and the rampant use of violence as a mode of capitalist necro-empowerment and wealth accumulation. If we were to do so, we would neutralize the possibility of action against them and obscure the fact that these processes regularly impact the bodies of all those who are part of the minority becoming, upon whom, one way or another, all of this brutal violence falls. Thus, we propose an analysis of Gore capitalism, understood as, quote, the systematically uncontrolled and contradictory dimension of the neoliberal project, end quote. It is a product of economic polarization, the excesses of information advertising that create and support a hyper-consumerist hyper identity and its counterpart, the ever-shrinking numbers of people with the financial power to satisfy their consumer desires. This process creates radical capitalist subjects, we term Andriago subjects, and new discursive figures that make up an episteme of violence, as well as reconfigures the concept of work through a perverse sense of agency, now rooted in the necropolitical commercialization of murder. All of this is evidence of the dystopias produced through an unconsidered adherence to pacts with masculinist neoliberalism and its objectives. Andriago subjectivities are created in the face of this world order, as individuals seek to establish themselves as valid subjects with the possibility of belonging and ascending within society. These subjects create new fields out of one of the most ferocious, devastating, and irreversible processes of capitalist investment. They contradict the logic of what is acceptable and normative because of their new awareness that they have become redundant in the economic order. These subjects confront their situation and their context by means of necro-empowerment and the fugitive dystopian necro-practices of gore as they convert this process into the only possible reality and attempt to legitimate the processes of underground economies, black market, drug trafficking, weapons, bodies, etc., through their reign of violence. These actions both create and reinterpret new fields apart from the valid ones and thereby wield influence over political, public, official, social, and cultural processes. As Pratt affirms, quote, once we live in a world of bandits and pirates, now in the form of coyotes and polleros, drug traffickers, hitmen, kidnappers, etc., who work on the borders of the whole planet, end quote. It is no accident that drug trafficking is currently the largest industry in the world, followed by the legal economies of fossil fuels and tourism, that drug money flows freely through the arteries of global financial systems, or that drug trafficking is itself one of the clearest examples of gore capitalism. It is clear that, quote, this is not the scene we imagined for the beginning of the new millennium, end quote, but it is the one we are faced with. It is our philosophical responsibility to analyze it in order to expose the weakness and inflexibility of discourses of globalization and neoliberalism, which are unable to explain these processes. 
contemporary history is no longer written from the perspective of the survivors, but rather through the number of dead. That is, the litany of cadavers has been an answer to the clearly utopian character of the official discourses about globalization, subverting the optimistic discourse of flow brought on by globalization, since now what flows freely is not people, but drugs, violence, and the capital these produce. This represents an inversion of terms, whereby life is no longer valued in and of itself, but only as an object of monetary exchange in the market, a transvaluation whereby the only measure of value is the ability to mete out death to others. Necropower is exercised from unexpected quarters for the benefit of official power holders. The explosion of unrestrained and hyper-specialized violence is evidence of the lack of any regulatable future, along with the fact that in capitalism's interstices, no one has anything to lose because life is no longer important, which means the taboo against killing has been entirely undone. Violence continually iterated in the here and now makes it impossible to contemplate the idea of the future in the ways the West has customarily done. The violence demands a reassessment of futurity itself. Driven by capitalism's interpretive monopoly, ignorance and contempt for the third world have taught us to see other elements and historical dynamics, those of the others, as insignificant. Neglect and contempt have provoked a response born of silence and invisibility that seems at once unstoppable and unfathomably violent. The result is a process of capitalism's deformed duplication, an unfolding of parallel identities in places, spaces, and subjects that incorporate, retranslate, and fuse together these experiences into something simultaneous, emancipatory, and fragmentary. We thus see that, quote, the incapacity of neoliberalism to generate belonging, collectivity, and a believable sense of the future produces, among other things, enormous crises of existence and of meanings that are being lived by the non-consumerists and consumerists of the world informs that the neoliberal ideology can neither predict nor control. End quote. It is precisely in this space where we encounter the relevance and importance of thinking about gore capitalism. Well, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for your patience. And uh, it's uh, for me, it's really important to make this uh, translation uh, uh, because uh, it seems like uh, fr I'm from the border, so it reflects the, the difference between the male, white, uh, correct pronunciation, masculine uh, accent uh, from the north in the United States, but it's uh, my translator. It's uh, also a um, uh, border boy, but uh, the other side of the border. So uh, it's, uh, for me, also a... Uh, an exercise to make uh, keep attention in the voice because we don't listen that much. We just uh, see things and we need to listen and to take time to listen. So I, I do it because that and also because uh, I like to make performs, but also uh, for, uh, for uh, to begin again, to begin again, uh, I want to, uh, Thanks uh, for the invitation to the museum, to Suzanne, to Pascal, uh, to uh, Evelyn and uh, Anna and uh, uh, Laura that it makes happen this thing together. So thank you very much for the, the, the whole huge work that you do and uh, because uh, the things doesn't uh, made itself. Yeah, you have to do it. So thank you very much for, for the invitation and uh, I'm, I'm going to show you some images about uh, um, the border, uh, the north border of uh, Tijuana, San Diego, but also gory capitalism is really a reflection about the link between colonialism, masculinity, drug trafficking, uh, and also violence against women and other population that become in minorities, migrants, and other persons. But also uh, the idea of uh, narco culture is like uh, this, this is representation of this cowboys, uh, Mexican, persons with uh, weed and arms and big uh, vehicles like uh, uh, 
uh, you know, and it's a kind of a representation, a really colonial representation of the other. It's a, like a, they have to be the other, they have to be savages, and they have to be monsters to be understandable as uh, Mexicans, uh, violent persons to uh, make um, an invisible the responsibility of the global market and the influence of the illegal economy in the legal legal economy. So I put it here, and I, I think it, this is a very image to understand what it uh, means, gory capitalism. I don't want to uh, put any more blood on the images because there is a lot of them and all the time we just thought about uh, violence in Mexico it's uh, people dismembering people people fighting each other and uh, you know I, I it's about <laughs> all the whole thing it's about money and it is a border economic border uh, place so uh, I want to present the border, Tijuana border, that you, uh, I, I'm really sure that you saw it before and uh, other presentations, but also in many other uh, presentations, but I want to show you that uh, this really dystopian place, it seems like a regular place with a huge, uh, fantastic weather and a huge uh, sunny, sunny uh, light, but, um, it's uh, there is, is the border uh, between uh, you. This this way is Mexico. The, the front is Mexico, and the other part uh, you can see there is uh, San Diego. It's the United States, and it's uh, if you see uh, there is uh, this uh, new border, but it's also three new. Uh, they are three walls, and uh, that's because uh, when Donald Trump said that he want to make again. Uh, uh, a new border or new goal for us is not meaningless less because uh, we already have three and uh, and the border it's not just uh, about uh, migration it's about other stuff that may maybe we can discuss uh, when the in the question and answers uh, take place this is the this is image uh, it's um, Recent, really recent image. Uh, they don't have uh, this. Uh, the the part of the up the up of the wall. It was is, that is new, and it's, they put it because the migrant Honduranian mi migrant caravan, and also well, it, this is an inter many interventions of uh, people who are trying to cross the border or also who are deported and um, and there is a, this is a, an, a migrant and this uh, uh, the the white image is a Mexico map and also the the signalization of the limits between Mexico and United States is the there there is a there is an inscription and said aquí empieza la patria that's uh, the 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 nationalist Mexican state begins here, and also uh, I just put this one uh, because it's uh, you know it looks really happy, colorful, uh, sunny day. But also you can see uh, the helicopters all the time to just crossing and watching uh, in the border. So it's a kind of uh, uh, contradictory image. And also you can see that uh, it, there is a uh, United States, you can see through the, the wall and there is a uh, border patrol uh, uh, cops and they are all day of, over there and well, but also we make a daily life uh, in this gory context, uh, we make a daily life like uh, even the dystopia wasn't there. And I, I want to show you some uh, real images from the border, not just the uh, dead ones or killing each other, just other ways to organize the daily life in the border. And then the last one is uh, San Isidro port entry. This is a, a new barricade. They, they made it because the Honduranian caravan wants to cross and they put it, all this in the, in that day, the the army of the United States was in front of that uh, barricade, and uh, it seems like uh, normal, but it's uh, it's really dangerous stuff 
uh, that is happening right now in, in the border because necropolitics or necropolitics is the way the, the border uh, north, it's, uh, the north is making the border as a, a dispositive to, uh, to, ma to, to make a genocide against some population and don't pay a uh, responsibility for, for that. And uh, well, this is another one, and and this uh, I I like to show it because uh, right there you can see uh, that image that the, the wall in, enter into the sea, oh, but you can see that uh, there is a like a, we have to see with distance this border because everybody and every and in the image of of the border is just really close and doesn't permit to understand that, that the function of that, of that border more than a global way, not just a simply simplify a structure of governmentability that it's a, who is a dystopian and violent and uh, bullshit, but it's also kind of a, uh, the global cartography of the financial markets and also the illegal markets. So I will, uh, let let it hear, and uh, we we have a conversation with Toby, and we will have a translator because I feel more comfortable in Spanish uh, talking in Spanish, and uh, and bueno, and then thank you very much for your attention and and thanks. Now we're on. Thank you so much for that uh, presentation performance, Sayak, and those impressive images we just saw. Um, we have about 25 minutes, roughly half an hour up here. And for you, I have a couple of questions to start this conversation out with. And um, actually, I would like, with the preface um, of the book, prior to the introduction of which we heard something now that is written in a totally different style, it's more like a poem. Um, and if you're okay with that, I'd like to read that uh, with my non-existent Spanish, but I hope I'll cope. And it begins like this, I quote, Esto es queer land, aquí empieza la patria. The homeland begins here, quote, end, esto es Tijuana. At the brink of El Bordo, I become blade. Tijuana is affectionate, unfathomable, full of possibilities, to be in love with a psychopath and to say so with a smile. You should leave now. This is Tijuana. That's the preface to Gore Capitalism right at the beginning. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us something about the possibilities you see there, the possibilities you reference in that um, preface about agency in Gore, uh, in Gore capitalism. What is agency in Gore capitalism? What can you do about it, in other words? This is something I read into the preface and I'm wondering if I'm right or not. Sí, buenas tardes. Eh, voy a hablar en español. Tenemos el traductor. Creo que también es importante que me escuchen hablar así, porque así es como escribo y así es como pienso. Y, esta, y, y la traducción también es una especie como de ventriloquía. ¿Qué pensa? El, el prefacio, como tú lo denominas, es un poema que se llama Esto es Tijuana y mi idea sobre el capitalismo gore empieza con ese poema. Creo que debemos... Dar, ¿No? ¿Sí? Vale. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you once again um, and I would like to continue speaking in my mother tongue in Spanish. I think it's very important that all of you hear me speaking in Spanish because that's the way that I wrote the book, that's the language I wrote the book in, and, and language is uh, what this is all about at the end of the day. Um, the introduction that you just mentioned is a poem and it's, uh, there's a special reason why I picked that poem to start my book about core capitalism. Lo escribí, eh, un poema que escribí después de encontrar un cuerpo descuartizado mientras iba transitando por la calle 
y donde me di cuenta de que la violencia en Tijuana era responsabilidad mía y del Estado y bueno, que la violencia implicaba a muchas personas y que no podíamos seguirla pensando como algo que pasaba de unas personas contra otras, de, de, de los criminales contra otros criminales, sino que era un ecosistema en el que nos mantenían para, para gobernarnos. ¿no? And the reason why I chose uh, or I came up with this poem in the introduction was uh, that once when I went for a walk, I found a dismembered body. Um, and at, at that moment, I realized that the responsibility of the killings and of the violence uh, was not only li laying with other people, with other players, with uh, criminals or politics, but that it was also uh, my shared responsibility because I was living in the same political ecosystem. Y, y la, el concepto de agencia dentro del poema, o la idea de agencia que tiene Occidente es salir de un espacio de subalternización, como de alguna manera uh, ascender de la precariedad, pero la, el agenciamiento que yo estoy planteando en el capitalismo or es aquel agenciamiento que toman las personas subalternizadas a través del ejercicio de la violencia y le dan la vuelta a las lógicas de ese mismo agenciamiento. Yo a eso le denomino necroempoderamiento. Y esa lógica de necroempoderamiento está muy vinculada con el, el, la lógica de los emprendedores económicos. Um, you asked about agency and um, I want to uh, speak out for all the people that are um, suppressed and also affected by the violence Um, I want to uh, give them a voice in a way um, and also show how everybody is linked in that um, necro empowerment situation, how some are victims and some others are actors. Mm. Quizá agregar eh, que voy a repetir que la lógica del necroempoderamiento basa su lógica del asesinato y el, como un trabajo de la lógica del emprendedurismo. And also to add that the logic of necroempowerment um, bases its um, decisions of uh, decision making of uh, killing of violence. It's based on a capitalist and uh, an entrepreneurial scheme. Uh, do you have another question? Yeah. <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, let's just try to delve a little deeper into the concept of core capitalism and uh, maybe stick to the first question just for one moment more um, and ask you if I got that right now, you stress the complicity of yours um, you know, into core capitalism. You are sort of part of that. That's what you mentioned when finding that dismembered body. But in the poem, you uh, also speak of the possibilities. That is full of possibilities. So what would, could you give us an example uh, of a possibility to sort of lose that complicity or to reduce that complicity or to do something about it? Is there, like in terms of activism, what would you propose and give us a little bit more detail about maybe? Eh, mi propuesta es, uh, ante, ante el necroempoderamiento y ante la violencia generalizada, primero impugnar la lógica estatal de que el, la violencia era todo lo que había en México, que, que es todo lo que hay porque es una, una narrativa estatal para controlarnos y quitarnos derecho. Y mi propuesta es hacer, en el, en, con Capitalismo Gor, lo que quiero hacer es hacer una crítica de colonial a la historia colonial de nuestro país que se sigue repitiendo a través justamente de a, abrazar las lógicas del neoliberalismo, del exitismo y del progreso, que son las lógicas de Occidente, y decir que de alguna manera tenemos que desengancharnos de eso y que la gente que está siendo responsable o creando comunidad desde un lugar que no es violento, somos más personas que las que sí están haciéndolo. Creo que la perspectiva feminista en este sentido, la perspectiva de colonial y la vuelta un poco del discurso y de la historia a decir que nos tenemos que hacer cargo de, de este proyecto de gobernamentabilidad, de la modernidad colonial que sigue viviendo en las fronteras. Yes, okay. <coughs> 
Well, my suggestion is that we reject um, that feeling of uh, that we are victims of, of violence, that violence is only what takes place south of the border in Mexico, that we are a people that is inherently violent. I do believe that um, from a, uh, that, that, that I try to uh, bring forward a um, criticism of colonialism and to show that our country has been um, made to take on the, the burden of neoliberalism and we, we are forced to advance according to the, um, well, the, uh, <clears throat> the supportive arguments of neoliberalism, of colonialism, and I also think that the viewpoint of feminism and uh, decolonialism is something that we have to embrace and take charge of in order to uh, reject that point of view that we are a inherently violent people. Okay. Let me try to broaden the scope um, on one side and then focus it a little more on the other. And I'm trying to do that with a term that keeps reappearing in your book, and we've heard it today uh, also, the term is hyper-consumerism. I mentioned it already in the introduction, it played a certain role in your talk, and this is something I find so interesting precisely because we have known that term for so long, and we have known for so long uh, what this problem leads to, uh, let's say endless growth. I mean, we've been warned about this um, in the late 60s, beginning of the 70s with the Club of Rome, and yet, at still think it's hard to address that problem somehow. I mean, there's no political party, at least in this country, who would address something like hyper-consumerism or degrowth. You instantly lose any election if you do that. I mean, we know that from the Green Party. If you say you have to eat vegetables once in a week, you're just off the stage, you're booed away. I mean, you just cannot do that. It's very hard to do it, but we all know what hyper-consumerism leads to, and uh, many things we've heard about um, today, like surveillance even, I mean, there's like endless growth means also endless traffic, right? If you have endless traffic in the internet, there's endless surveillance, uh, endless uh, drug trafficking. Um, so uh, what to do? I mean, was, would this actually mean to counter that sort of hyper-consumerism you see at the heart of the problem also? Would that lead necessarily to a aesthetic of asceticism, askese in Deutsch. I mean, that's a very unpopular thing to say. I know that. I mean, it would mean not do any cocaine. It would mean travel less. Uh, it would mean buying less. It would mean consuming less. As it's, it's, you know, the term says it already, hyper-consumerism. Would you advocate, in the end, that would be the simple question, an aesthetic of asceticism? Uh, para mí, el concepto de hiperconsumo eh, no solamente es una práctica igual que la de trabajo, ya es una forma de producción de subjetividad. La gente, eh, primero desmantelaron la idea de solidaridad a través de la clase social, desmantelaron la idea de que la pobreza, esencializaron la pobreza diciendo que la gente es pobre y no que es una clase social donde se puede prestar la solidaridad. Cre creo que primero podemos decir eso. Como, otra vez, eh, que el, hiper, el hiperconsumo, o hiperconsumerismo no es solamente un concepto que tenga que ver con consumir, sino que produce un tipo de subjetividad. Y sobre todo produce un tipo de subjetividad que impacta a la gente que no puede consumir. No solamente tienen que consumir un poco, sino que tienen que hiperconsumir. En Europa parece que no hiperconsumen, pero la, la cosa es que aquí cualquier cosa de consumo normal cuesta cinco veces lo que podría costarnos a nosotros en en nuestro contexto latinoamericano. Entonces, ser un consumidor en Europa es ser un consumidor. Ser un consumidor de ese tipo en Latinoamérica sería ser un hiperconsumidor. La gente está destinada a más bien al infraconsumo por la escasez y por, por la degradación económica. Entonces, lo que quieren es parecerse al consumo de aquí, pero en ese lugar se vuelve un hiperconsumo. Um, Hyperconsumerism... Um in my view, produces a notion of subjectivity, um, which is uh, dismantling of the um, self-consciousness of 
uh, of lower class of poor um, people. Here in Europe, as an example, whatever you buy, you will pay around five times as much as for the product as you would pay for in Latin America. And I, I think that trying to get the uh, poorer people to always want more, more, more and um, live up to the expectations of hyper-consumerism is the root of the problem. Y tengo una cosa más que apuntar. El hiperconsumo o la subjetividad de hiperconsumo es la subjetividad que imita el éxito a la subjetividad de tipo ganador y una subjetividad que blanquea de alguna manera y que te quita el estigma en el tercer mundo de ser una persona racializada. El dinero blanquea y la pobreza oscurece. Entonces el hiperconsumo se vuelve una forma de exorcizar también esa parte colonial. Um, I also think, just to add, that hyperconsumerism um, is a way to exonerate poor people from their stigma of being poor because um, the more they achieve, the more they win according to the laws of um, capitalism, the, the freer they are of their stigma of poverty. And um, so it's easy to say that, and easy to see that um, money kind of whitens your uh, appearance and, and poverty makes you uh, fall back. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, it's good. I, I want to translate it because it's kind of difficult, really difficult to translate myself in, 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 in the end, and that's why. But it's uh, also, uh, I, I want to just put something in and uh, in pin something that I'm not criminalize the poor people, and I even don't think there, there's a poor people, there's a cl uh, class that calls class work people, but it's a uh, Poor, poorness is not an essential of the bodies or the persons as the, and are structures of empo uh, empowerment or impoverish, impoverishment of the persons, but not the person itself are poor. So uh, just because I don't want to criminalize that, that populations and then also because the class, the, the idea of the class in the Marxist way is uh, really important to think about again, because uh, in this context that the work is almost a commodity, you know, that <laughs> you have a job, that you have a commodity, you, we, we have to think again about the, the, the work and the relation with uh, gender. And in, in the center of the gory capitalism, my critique was uh, uh, the, the masculinity has a cartography, not as a body, sex body, but it's a cartography of the design of the state that retroduced this the national state to the Mexican bodies of male and make this governance against uh, all populations with the ne necromasculinity or masculinity who kills to uh, control people, territories, and other stuff. But also that kind of uh, masculinity is linked with the other masculinity, the this national state, European, white, and uh, progressive state. So we are monsters because you are humans, almost like that. And we have to maintain that appearance of monsters to uh, put it, uh, uh, the national state of European and whiteness uh, has democratic and, uh, and valuable and humanistic and everything. You know, it's a kind of more difficult than that, but I, I want to put it that this and that really not uh, maybe brilliant or um, I consider their uh, terms, but it's about uh, the, the new fight or the fight in the, in the border the, about the intermittency of the colonialism and the laboratory of colonialism that it, it, it situates in the, in the border and it's related with the economic, legal and illegal. <laughs>